hello everyone, good morning, good afternoon and evening uh, and welcome to uh, on the dialogue on youth for enhanced climate action, developing a strategy for youth in climate action. Before commencing the event, I would like to go over some house rules to ensure a smooth flow uh, for our event. Uh, during the keynote speech and the panel discussions, I would kindly request everyone to keep their microphone switched off or muted, and any questions you may have, we are more than happy to take them uh, at our Q&A ses Q &A sessions. Um, and we do have an event registration form for this event, which is now shared on the chat box, so please do take a minute and fill it out. Uh, just to start off, this uh, event is hosted by Slack and Trust as a part of the ACE Youth Forum. Uh, the Youth Forum is primarily aimed to support an intergenerational dialogue and highlight work being done on the ACE elements. Um, our event today will consist of a keynote speech by Ms. Fleur Newman, the, uh, the unit head of ACE gender and youth at UNFCCC, followed by a panel discussion with Ms. Jennifer Hanna, Mr. Mr. Dennis Momba, uh, Mr. Sunny Ayuba, Mr. Duncan Williamson, Mr. Ashant Karunananda, Mr. Samuel Andruke, and Mr. Kamidu Edirivira, who, will, who I will introduce with more details following the open, opening interventions. Today's event, We'll then move on to three breakout sessions to discuss some of the key questions. To commence with the event for the day, I would like to invite Ms. Vusita Vijayanayaka, the Executive Director of Slight and Trust, to give us the welcome address and introduction to this event. Vasita, over to you. Hello, thank you, Roni. Um, so good morning, good afternoon, good evening, uh, wherever you're joining us from, uh, because I see we have a lot of people from across the world joining us today. Thank you for joining this session, uh, and I warmly welcome all of you uh, for joining us. Um, and, and I hope the session would be a very um, constructive and productive one where we have active participation. Um, so I'm also very grateful for Fleur and all the other speakers for joining us today. Um, and for Jennifer as well, uh, um, for making that time to be part of today's discussion. Um, I know everyone is very busy, a lot of things are happening, um, so it's, it's very appreciated that all of you are here today. Um, just to highlight what Slack and Trust does as an organization, most of you are familiar faces, but for those who are not uh, familiar with the work that we do, um, so we have a key focus on gender and youth as one of our focus areas in the work that we do. We are a nonprofit civil society think tank, uh, and we work at local, national, as well as international levels. Um, and the present work that we do focusing on youth have um, a local focus, national focus, as well as um, work that relate to knowledge management and research that could contribute to international processes. Um, so capacity building, uh, awareness creation, research, climate action, uh, we work on all these. And we also have a key focus on youth engagement across the board. Um, so we have some work that we're doing in Africa with some of our partners uh, in Asia as well, and um, identifying how, for example, youth could be more in included or engaged in decision-making processes which relate to climate change adaptation, um, for example, NDCs. So um, we're also doing work related to developing strategies, for example, youth climate action strategies. Uh, one we work on is in, uh, in Ghana with the government as well as a local partner. Uh, we are also working in Niger with some of our speakers here, and we hope to expand um, some of this work across uh, Africa with their partnership as well. I think Sunny would be able to give more information on this. Um, yeah, so, and Food System Summit is an opportunity that uh, we've seized to engage youth as well. Um, so we have sessions happening. There's one happening on um, 26th of July as one of the parallel sessions of the pre-summit where we have a focus on youth and the engagement of youth in the processes related to food systems and risk management. Uh, so we're looking forward to seeing how we can engage youth more in risk transfer, risk management, uh, climate and disaster risk related discussions as well. Um, and one of the main things that we would be uh, focusing on in the few um, months that are coming ahead would be the Global Youth Forum, the launch of it for this year. Um, I think there are speakers who will give you more 
more information on this uh, in the next hour. So I'm not going to go into too many uh, aspects. I just want to welcome all of you, just lay a few things that we do uh, that we could contribute to your work as well as um, collaborate with you in doing work. Um, one note uh, before I close, um, we do a lot of work pro bono uh, when it comes to technical um, support provision. So if there are organizations um, that need technical support in developing policies and strategies and engaging in decision making processes like uh, related to knowledge products that relate to um, the work that I just mentioned, do get in touch with us and um, I hope we can help you and work with you as well. So um, with that, I'll close uh, this welcome speech and uh, pass the mic to Rooney. Thank you very much. Thank you, Lasita, for the introduction to our event today. Uh, to move forward, I would like to invite our keynote speaker for the day, Ms. Fleur Newman. Unit lead is Gender and Youth with the UNFCCC to address this event. Ms. Newman, over to you. Thank you so much, Ruani, and thank you to the Slack and Trust for the invitation to join you today. It's always uh, my pleasure to, to, to be here with you. Um, and I'm, I'm, I'm sure that much of what I'm going to, to speak on now is, is perhaps not new, but I think uh, given the, the emergency that we are facing, it's worth repeating some of these things more than once. So I'm, I think it's obvious to everyone who's joined today that the climate emergency is a complex challenge and that it can't be solved by governments alone. For such a challenge, we need everyone to be equipped and empowered to get involved and to support um, each other, but also to support government climate action and with the aim of driving greater ambition. The Convention and the Paris Agreement provide the tools for a whole of society approach to addressing the climate emergency. Action for climate empowerment, and for, again, for those who are on the call, I'm sure you know this, but for those who don't, also known as ACE, has its six interconnected elements, climate education and training, as well as public awareness, public access to information, public participation, and international cooperation on all of these issues, and with children and, and youth as a cross-cutting focus. Climate literacy is the cornerstone for implementing ambitious climate policy and action by ensuring a broad understanding of the issue and catalyzing innovation in climate mitigation and ad adaptive capacity. And ACE strives to ensure lifelong climate literacy for everyone, although it has a focus on, an on children and youth, it also has a focus on inclusion of everyone. ACE is an important part of achieving a healthy, safe and just future and it does take all segments of society. It provide, provides a framework for that education and empowerment for addressing climate change in the context of other big challenges. And we are continuing to face the challenge of COVID-19. All elements of ACE are also foundational for the just transitions that are required to move to the low carbon climate resilient economies and societies that uh, the Paris Agreement envisages. Not only in obvious sectors such as renewable energy, but we need curious, clever minds turned to decarbonizing public and private transport while making it more, equi while making it more equitable, rethinking urban and built environments, redesigning food systems, strengthening the resilience of our health systems and redirecting capital among many other areas. This obviously starts with quality education that integrates climate change across all curricula, from economics to civics, to science, to art and beyond. It starts in kindergarten, building through all of the different stages of, of formal education, as well as in vocational education. We need to normalise lifelong learning in different formats because the climate emergency will continue to create firsts and unprecedented events. And as I speak to you today from Bonn, not 30 minutes away, one of those unprecedented events has happened and has caused tragic loss of life. What we want 
is for us all to be able to thrive. And for that, we need to be adaptable and agile. While technological solutions are undoubtedly needed, so too are solutions to address the urgent shifts in understanding and acceptance of the changes in our behaviour that the climate emergency demands. And the important role that youth must play in climate action cannot be overstated. It is your future, their future, that is being decided today by public and private investment or a lack of investment in climate resilient economies and societies. As such, young people have the right, and those of us who are not so young have a responsibility to ensure that young people can meaningfully contribute to addressing the challenge and shaping the future. I'd also like to highlight um, that we have, uh, I'd, I'd like to highlight one of the um, multi-stakeholder initiatives and, and one of the things about ACE is that it is multi-sectoral, multi multi-stakeholder, uh, uh, this, this need to, to see things um, from a systems perspective. We have a, an initiative known as the Youth Empowerment and Climate Action Platform or YECAP, and that's been created to serve the needs of young people in Asia and Pacific, and it's a partnership between the UNFCCC, RCC in Bangkok, UNDP, UNICEF, and three youth constituencies, Young Group, Movers, and the 2030 Youth Force. And the year cap activity, activities cover some of the areas um, that have been identified through consultations with uh, young people in the region and, and more broadly. Um, and the, the platform centers is centered on the needs and perspectives of children and youth. 2021 is an important year for ACE under the intergovernmental process uh, in the lead up to COP26 in Glasgow this year. Although ACE is grounded in an article under both the convention and the Paris Agreement, these articles don't provide much detail on how to. And so the latest work program or the how to for different actors and at different levels known as the Doha Work Programme, which started in 2012, ended last year. And parties to the convention are reviewing the success and challenges arising from that work programme and looking to agree a successor work programme at COP26 to support the implementation of Article 6 of the convention and Article 12 of the Paris Agreement. Early indications are that the focus on children and youth in climate action will be enhanced in, the, in this new work program. But it's important to note that youth are not waiting for that decision to get involved. In fact, as the official children and youth constituency under the UNFCCC, representatives of Yungo have been actively contributing to the design of the future ACE work program through written and oral submissions. And obviously also this uh, amazing week of ACE is contributing to raising awareness about ACE and to stimulate dis discussions on how to strengthen its implementation. Beyond this, there's also the Conference of Youth 16 and the local Conference of Youth and the virtual concert, Conference of Youth that have all been happening, that have either happened or will happen later this year. So in closing, I wish to reiterate my earlier point. We need everyone to be informed, involved, and contributing to the urgent transition we need to low carbon, just, and climate resilient economies and societies. And young people need to be at the center. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ms. Newman, for your valuable input. Uh, I'm sure I can speak on behalf of the audience to say that we've learned a lot from your address, as we always do. And thank you again for taking your time. To move forward, I would like to invite Sinashe Ignaka to uh, take us through our first mentimeter session. Sinashe, over to you. Um, thanks so much, uh, Roni, and thank you, Ms. Newman, for that. Um, opening seat as well um, and I hope everyone was paying close attention because we have a quiz coming up a little later and a lot of what Ms. Newman said is actually included in that. So we'll start off with our first dementia beta. Um, if you all have joined us for our previous programs you would know that we enjoy doing these 
Mentimeters. So there is a code on uh, the chat. So if you could log on to menti.com and there should be a little field that lets you fill in a code. So type in the code 2389-0476. And uh, we are going to test uh, for the first 30 seconds. Um, so you should have a little pin on your screen and you could uh, drag the pin and then uh, place it from where you are joining us today. And I'm going to try my best uh, at guessing where that is. So we have one person from Europe and someone <laughs> from in between North America and South America. Uh, so we have two people from Europe. Um, we do have quite a few people joining from Sri Lanka. Um, uh, we have someone from, I think, somewhere close to Indonesia, so I'm assuming that South Korea, um, someone from East Asia. Um, okay, we have some, okay, that could be, since I can't zoom in, so that's India and Sri Lanka, someone from the African continent. I'm not very sure what that is, but I believe that would be funny from Niger. And uh, someone from Maldives. So, okay, uh, thank you everybody for. Uh, pinning us, pinning your location on the screen and letting us know where you're from. Uh, it's good to know that we have people from, well, most of the continents uh, with us today and uh, hope that would continue and contribute towards the larger discussion. Uh, so welcome. So let's move on to just one more uh, question before handing it back to Bernie. So um, basically, why do you think it is important for you to engage in climate action? You could type it as very responsive as you click and uh, you can probably read out some and uh, please. Okay, they have new ideas. Okay, so yeah, youth have new ideas and it would be good to have them included in the process. Shade, yes. Youth are the future policymakers. Correct. Um, The older generations have failed to act in terms of trust and the right thing now. There's a change makers. Um, and we will do it for about two or three more responses and creative skills, yeah, which are very good, especially when it comes to designing your future policies as well. Um, youth are significantly decision making process, exactly. Youth are courageous and take action, they're young and active. Um, well, you, you could be young at heart too, so uh, yes, and also for leadership, yeah. All right, uh, that, that's great, and uh, I think we're in the right spirit in moving forward with this session. So uh, with that, we will go back to the main session. Thank you, everybody, for taking part, and uh, over to you, Bernie. Uh, thank you, Sanashia. I think that was an interesting session. Uh, to move forward, now we'll be commencing the panel discussions with our distinguished panelists. Our uh, panelists for the day are Ms. Jennifer Hanna, member of the Paris Committee on Capacity Building, Mr. Dennis Momba, Director of Research and Knowledge Management, Strike and Trust, Mr. Sadi Ayuba, Founder, Executive Director, Young Volunteers for the Environment, Niger, Mr. Duncan Williamson, Founder and Director, Nourishing Food Systems, Mr. Ashan Karnanada, Coordinator, Global Youth Forum on Climate Change, Strike and Trust, Mr. Samuel Agro Kirek, Founder, Inova Hubs, Mr. Kamidu Ebiribira, Project Manager, Youth Empowerment, Strike and Trust. I'd firstly like to thank all our panelists for your participation today and welcome uh, and I'd like to welcome you all for the to the discussion. So uh, just to move forward, the first question for the day will now be visible on the screen. Yes, uh, just to start off with this would be the first question for the day. And I will pick up, um, how can you be empowered to engage in climate change? What skills and capacities are needed for them to better engage in climate action, including examples of challenges and ways to address them? Um, I'd first just like to start off uh, yet to give the floor to uh, Ms. Uh, Jennifer Hanna. And then we will move on to Sunny, Ashan, and Samuel as we go. Well, thank you very much, Ruwani, and I'm happy to be here. Um, I'm, I'm always very um, 
eager to participate in, in, in these events and, and talk about a little bit how um, youth can engage in climate, in climate action. But uh, again, what that is the question, really. I think youth is already empowered to engage in climate action. I mean, look at this event and the increasing number of young people working in institutions and organizations that contribute to the implementation of climate action. Myself is a very good example of it. I like started working on this topic in 2009 and I was 19 years old. So it's, I've been developing all my whole life around this area in the different aspect. And from my aspect was more into a um, public policy um, arena. So it's, it's, there's a lot of um, areas that, that youth can be engaged in climate action. In, in, in terms from the PCCB, the Paris Committee Capacity Building Activities with a youth focus today, um, it has become very clear that young people are not just capacity recipients, but also capacity builders. And again, this is a perfect example of how and why we're calling you capacity builders, calling us capacity builders. So within the PCCB activities, we have focused in um, increasing awareness, but also in providing spaces for dialogue and brainstorming the best engagement strategy, which of course shift depends on the country that you're in and or the region that you're representing. In this sense, um, again, the PCCB uh, has been hosting a series of side events at this year UN C Regional Climate Weeks, highlighting the transformational role of youth in climate action. For example, within the um, Black side event, the Latin American Caribbean side event outcomes, uh, it was uh, a very strong call for enhanced youth access to finance, either through grants, loans, or scholarships to support the upscale and the increased uptake of innovations. And on the other hand, in the Asia Pacific side event, it was uh, highlighted that capacity of youth can be built to enhance NBC implementation by encourage them and enable their active participation in national, regional, international initiatives as young scientists, as awareness builders and in other major roles. For example, the NBC implementation roadmap in regional scientific collaborations such as Codex, Southeast Asia, and in the IPCC Global Assessment Reports preparation. In addition, there is a lot of knowledge that being imparted to youth in terms of climate science. It's very easy to understand because there's a way of us um, kind of relating it into a very um, simple language. But there's a need to build capacity of youth in terms of a specific technical knowledge around national policies, such as NDCs and IPCC reports. And I'm just going to leave it here. Thank you. Uh, thank you, uh, Jennifer. I would now like to open the floor to uh, Sunny. Um, okay, can you? Yes, for me, I'm totally uh, agree about the, the. Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you, sir. Hello. Okay, great. Sorry. So I, I say I'm totally agree about what you say uh, previously. So for for me, in terms of uh, how youth can be empowered to engage in climate change, it's very important to uh, in uh, to, uh, in addition to what they say is to see in the school curricula how we can include like topics uh, uh, that engage climate change action also. And also it's very important to, to engage at, uh, at the local level because at local level there are many things that young people can do or must do, but sometimes they don't have the necessary skills to do it. So, in terms of capacity building, I think it's very important to let them know what's climate change, what are its impact, what scientists are saying about it, and uh, what do we have uh, in terms of strategies uh, like uh, adaptation or mitigation, and which one is very important depending on, on, on the country, on the context, on the local background. So, so for me, that is the kind of uh, uh, capacity that young people need 
uh, young people need to understand the challenge regarding the climate change negotiation because you know when you go to the UNFCC negotiation there is not in every place or everywhere that you can have uh, the possibility to, to hear about the young voices and also young people must be prepared in order to, to well deliver when they go through this kind of conferences and to analyze how the climate change impacts their community, how the climate change also uh, uh, impact their life, their daily life. Because here we have in Niger, like the example, the majority of our people are young people or the community, 70% are living in rural area. So for these people that are living in rural area, their main activities are based on raining season, on agriculture, they are farmers, they, uh, they have activities uh, like uh, they have an, uh, animal husbandry, all those things. So they know, they, they need skills uh, to adapt their activities. They know, they, they, uh, they need skills to stay at their place. Because when you see that, uh, for example, in our context, we have that the population grow. We have also uh, the people that uh, leave their community or their village because they have disaster risk, they have flooding, or they have dust or drought. So they don't have anything uh, to feed their family or feeding their son, so they have to leave. So this, is, this issue of women mobility also is very critical, and young people need to have skills to adapt themselves, to stay in their community, and to work regarding the way that uh, the risk can inform the development. So it's very important, and they need also uh, capacity to analyze the policies because we have a lot of strategies and policy but young people sometimes don't have enough skills to understand this kind of uh, language or this level of intervention for so for me it is the the, the the suggestion or the kind of competency that we need at, as young people and when, when it's come to listen to the scientists i know that everywhere in every country we have the scientists that develop strategies and solutions based on nature or local solution. Young people must be involved in this kind of process uh, in order to well uh, contribute in their implementation. So now we have like the NDC, we have the Venero on SDGs, all these kind of policies or program young people must have enough skills to understand this kind of language and also how to follow them. This is my contribution for this question. Thank you. Um, I'm moving on to Ashan. Uh, thank you very much, Rooney. Uh, so uh, before moving to the question, I would like to like give a brief introduction on how the youth in uh, Sri Lanka, especially how they could like uh, uh, work in a way in order to protect um, uh, climate change. So if you take Sri Lanka, Sri Lanka is a small island located in the Indian Ocean. So over the past decade, climate change has impacted especially uh, Sri Lanka in a large way. And in the fact, Sri Lanka is one of the uh, rich biodiversity ca countries in the world. And also the country's uh, farmers actually depend on the agriculture. So this climate change could major make a huge impact to these areas. So if you take Sri Lanka has been ranked fourth and second in terms of climate risk in global climate risk index during the years 2018 and 2019. And impacts of climate change can be include like prolonged droughts, heavy rains, floods, temperature variation, destructive winds. So this could impact the country's agriculture as well as the biodiversity. So in this context, the youth can play a major role in to overcome this. So moving, so if we take the question, we could be divided into three. So the first, how can youth be empowered to engage in climate action? So in a way, I think if we can give more opportunities for the youth to engage in climate related activities, and also while we do this, we, are, we must be able to develop their soft skills. So at, at currently even at Slike and Trust, we conduct events in order, and we work with youth in order to develop these skills. So when you take key skills, I uh, I have uh, during my talk, I'm uh, hoping to highlight two key skills, which I think one is uh, the youth should have good leadership skills. In a way, like as I said, Sri Lanka is highly impacted from climate change. And if you take smaller areas are 
also impacted in the rural areas it's been impacted so that's like and trust we do ground level research in these rural areas and we have identified that these climate change impacts these agricultural sectors as well so what this youth in this area could do is these impacts should be identified and should be taken and taken uh, this after identifying this they could take actions in order to overcome it having leadership qualities is also not sufficient but it, they should have good communication and presenting skills i think that is also a key importance of the youth which they should be developed so if they find an impact in the area they should have the potential to take this message it whether it's a local level the national level and the international level where they could seek help in order to overcome these issues so then moving on to the final part of the question on how we could overcome uh, what are the challenges that youth face and in ways which could be addressed so what one of the uh, challenges which i could say is as uh, other speakers have mentioned the lack of education awareness and capacities especially this should be increased especially in countries like sri lanka we should work on it so one way uh, it's like we at sri lanka trust what we have done is we are we have organized the global youth forum and last year it was organized with the fifth consecutive uh, consecutive time and uh, participants across 70 countries joined this actually it was a good platform for the youth where they were able to engage with other uh, participants from other countries and in addition the experts were allowed to uh, were shared their uh, ideas and uh, valuable presentations which helped to gain knowledge in addition during this forum we requested for proposals where youth got together and sent in proposals in the teams ocean and coastal ecosystems biodiversity climate change and disaster risk and sustainable food systems so this uh, there was a voting system and the best eight was chosen and during the global youth forum these were developed with the comments of the experts and now it's in the stage where we have uh, written to the uh, for the uh, improvements of these uh, proposals and hopefully we are going to implement these in uh, selected areas and also this year again we are having a forum where the youth could join and uh, work with us and another key area is the lack of finance another challenge so while uh, at like and trust so we work a lot with the youth especially if you take uh, youth groups in environment organizations and other youth entities we work a lot and we have identified that they have very creative ideas and um, good projects where these issues could be overcome and the major issue is that they lack in the finance in implementing them so in a way the global youth forum is also a good platform where we could get them into uh, some connections so that they could work on their proposals more so in future we are planning uh, to have a good plan uh, a good method of engaging more youth and to develop the capacities and gain uh, give them more awareness in improving uh, their knowledge in climate change and how it impacts our country and how we could overcome it so uh, that's it, it from me thank you thank you ashar uh we i would now hand over the floor to um samira for your input all right thank you very much um rwani for the opportunity and we of course know that uh, we read a lot and of course we know that youth need soft skills capacity uh, to be built in the areas of negotiation persuasive dialogues and of course policy advocacy and of course true legislative processes and of course um, youth can also be apt in social engineering uh, skills that can help them in assessment of uh, initiatives of, of practices local practices uh, in local areas or in urban centers as it relates to climate change and of course or uh, individual or on community basis and of course there needs to be uh, interactive approach to sustainable um, sustainably managing uh, scenarios and situation based on cultural differences uh, of people they are relating with and of course uh, most importantly, the, uh, the youth needs uh, manage, manageria and management skills in 
approaching uh, challenges that has to do with climate change. And of course, these skills can be assessed through uh, the participations and practices in national adaptation planning, voluntary national reviews, and of course, uh, national uh, resource management control and knowledge of national determined contribution, the indices, and of course, key performance indices of some of these uh, uh, of these practices. And of course, we've been uh, in the midst of this in local in our local uh, areas and in local capacity, we've been able to contribute as youth or a youth organization into national uh, planning or suggested inputs for the indices. And I think this uh, is a good approach where you can also engage uh, uh, to further uh, broaden their scope and widen their horizons and experience in the issues that are pertaining to climate change. And of course, in understanding how to turn uh, most of the declarations, protocols, ambitions into leadership, and of course, with decisive actions based on their political, scientific, uh, legislative, or economic basis. And of course, uh, there are many uh, available platforms where you can actually learn a lot on, uh, on uh, they, they, they can actually have access to interactive learning tools on how to build most of these practices. And of course, we've heard about Agora tools um, being used to convey capacity building and training uh, information and of course uh, in a more interactive and in a more uh, integrative approach where uh, youths can better understand how to use uh, most of the tools that are available for, for mapping or for gathering data uh, based on indices, uh, uh, progress and processes. And of course we know of the UNCC LEN uh, we know of UNITA, we know of UNICEF, uh, we know of ONDESA, open data um, platforms and open learning platforms where youth can actually learn a lot about uh, what's, uh, what, what, what are the intricacies and the needful skills to be gained. And the, of course, the approach to go into uh, adaptation planning and indices and of course, issues relating to climate change in their local areas. And of course, um, uh, youth can uh, better uh, uh, solve challenges that are related to lack of uh, information, uh, to learning opportunities, and access to financial instruments uh, can also be seen as a challenge, a major challenge, criti critical challenge rather, to youth planning, of course, their own local initiatives, and of course, to solving uh, problems on the local basis on their own individually. So uh, youths need to leverage uh, already existing open knowledge platforms uh, to get information on relevant international laws, international treaties, charters, uh, protocols, conventions, and declarations. Uh, of course, and of course, when it comes to access to finance, uh, there are opportunities like the Global Youth Forum on Climate Change. It's an avenue for youths to uh, better get uh, insights on how to assess climate finance tools, um, know more about what climate finance is, and understand uh, platforms for climate finance and leadership benchmarking, so to say. So um, another challenge we see is the non-involvement of youth in policy and legislative processes and decision making, which is key. It is fundamental that uh, youth begin to get on, on, on the decision table, decision making table, and of course, this is the area where uh, their action is needed the most. They need to sit and discuss uh, issues that are pertaining to their future because climate change has more impact on the future on the youth than the present uh, uh, people, that people that are of this present age, youth still has the future ahead of them. And of course, it's a matter that has been discussed about their future, about uh, maybe they are they, whatever it is they uh, have as ambitions is a matter of uh, what the future holds for them and of course uh, climate action needs to be taken uh, at a time where it does need to be taken so if youth can at this point begin to get into uh, on on the table decision making table it would require a lot of confidence it will require a lot of uh, leadership 
It will require a lot of character. And of course, it will require a lot of skills, like I mentioned before, negotiation skills, uh, technical skills in, of course, doing a lot of mapping, planning, and of course, integrating on the local, regional, and of course, on the global level. So at this point, I would like to drop uh, 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 drop the mic and yield the floor to the next speaker. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Samuel. Actually, thank you to all the speakers that gave the input on this. I think we are off to a very good start for this panel discussion. And I can see that we have a few questions coming on the chat as well. So if you all do have any questions for our panelists, please feel free to put them on the chat. We will be having a Q&A session after the panel discussion. So uh, to move on for to the second question, um, it is how can education and awareness creation be a path to scale up climate action? Could you share experiences, sorry, uh, could you share experiences and examples from your work and references of good practice? So uh, to start off with, I'd like to give the floor uh, to Duncan to give us your. Yeah, thank you, thank you. I've got to, got to think about um, think about the question. I was ready for the previous one. Okay, so first of all, just to introduce myself, I I'm sort of not a youth. Uh, I'm sort of been working on. I'm a middle-aged man. I've been working on climate change since the 1990s. And I just want to say at the moment, I've never seen the debate so lively and so exciting. I mean, we've been calling for action for, I well, 60 years at least, and not enough has happened. In the last three years, since you know, Greta and all the fantastic work she's done and the youth quake that's followed it, there has been a massive acceleration in awareness among certain generation of what's happening and there is a movement starting to happen so i just think that is really really exciting and i think it's really the most important lesson that you'll learn or i will learn from this and from my past experience because i've been in move moments before where action has looked like it's happening uh we've been I've been using some of the arguments you have saying, I have the future ahead of me. Um, we've got the leadership, we've got the, we've, it's a youth movement. And our mistake was we took our eye off the, power, off the ball. And we, when we thought we'd got the action and the agreements we needed, we, we demanded, we looked at other problems and the powers that be didn't fulfill their promises. So the one thing I will say, whatever happens is, don't take your eye off the ball because you need to keep pushing and pushing and pushing because the second you look away, yes, I, I think things could happen. But so, but how can education and an awareness be key? Well, I, I am a massive fan of education. I've, I also used to be a teacher. I think they are the most important people in the world. And I think one of the reasons that we are seeing this youth quake at the moment is teachers st stood up 15 years ago and started teaching about climate change. And they didn't teach my generation that. We had to learn about it when we became adults. But the, your generation have been told about climate change in school. They've seen the consequences of the lack of action on climate change. And I think that is shows the power of education. And I think it's really important to keep educating and keep talking and for for the for young people it is educating your parents educating your parents generation educating your grandparents generation don't dismiss them don't think they don't know the answers they have so much experience so much knowledge and they can educate you as well but this cross-generational education can really change everything i'm excited about what's happening with young people but i also look at the people in their 70s and that is the other demographic that's taking the most action on climate change because they want to protect their grandchildren and their great grandchildren children so learn from them the education must be multi cross-generational i think it's really important i think awareness is useful but i don't think it's enough the one thing we have learned in the climate movement since the 90s is telling people about climate change 
is and raising awareness of it doesn't make any difference unfortunately the more we've we have had the evidence since the 1960s that climate change is happening we've talked about climate change we've shown people pictures we've had concerts for climate change we've marched through the streets of london we've rioted on the streets of new york for climate change uh, we've kept raising awareness and there hasn't been enough action so i think it's education i think it's action and i really think as, as a couple of the speakers have mentioned the best thing you can do is you we've got data use it knowledge is power don't wait for global agreements to yeah follow what you're saying they are too slow they're not going to do it but you've got the data you've never had more data than you have at the moment you've never had so much access as you've had at the moment i wish i mean it's hard to believe i wish where i was growing up in the 80s that we had the internet and computers we had to do everything by pen and paper um, a mobile phone was a thing of science fiction so you've got that and the other thing i would really really say around this as with your education use it and use it to vote i think voting is so important to spread your voice vote in local and national elections it breaks my heart when i see countries all over the world having turnouts of 20 or 30 percent vote and if your vote is ignored don't let them ignore it that's when you need to start shouting so that that's really where i am with this uh, but i'm so pleased to be here and i am so it's reignited my passion in something which sometimes gets me quite cynical and down. So thank you for that. And I really praise you for all your wonderful work. Thank you, Duncan. Thank you very much for your input. And it's very interesting. It's very nice to see um, you speak with such enthusiasm. Uh, I'd like to now open the floor uh, to Jennifer just to give her input on this question as well. Uh, thank you, Rowani. And I'm I'm just gonna say that I that I uh, fully agree with everything that Duncan just mentioned. Is 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 we we have seen through the years a very um, let's say accelerated um, difference of how the things used to be in the past and how we how it is now. Like education awareness are the the vehicles the, the main vehicles of climate action. In fact. It, when we're talking about the, the United Nations framework on climate change, we're talking about Article 6, we're talking about AIDS, Action for Climate Empowerment. And it's precisely, um, if, if you look into the definition of, of, of uh, not necessarily definition, but yeah, the content of that Article 6 of the convention, it specifically said it's the foundation of everything. It's like without education, without awareness, you cannot necessarily know uh, what are you facing and how can you create innovative and transformational solutions? And, uh, and I just want to uh, pick up into something that Duncan said is like, yes, we like our generation uh, a, a little bit more than, than, than me and than, than, than you guys, uh, we actually didn't know what climate act, what climate change was like we, didn't have all the resources that we have now in terms of vast information, different ways of uh, tackling the information. And what we're trying to do now, and Duncan mentioned it very, very, very clear, is that we're now training trainers to teach how we used to know, like, um, yes, you need to close the water when you brush your teeth because you're going to um, save water and, and natural resources through that. But now you're connected it with a bigger thing that is climate change and how that actually affects every single day activity. It affects how climate action it's being um, undertake even at individual and in, in, in a collective uh, level. So um, just, just, just to mention that and um, to, to give um, specific examples and again, this is this is this is very connected with the with the academic with academic institutions and what Duncan mentioned is that um, if we're talking about education and awareness creation to scale up climate action, uh, the academia is the best um, vehicle to do that. So um, there's also a need to rethink how academia tackles this. 
because you cannot um, keep doing the uh, conventional way, the um, directional way of um, communicating, producing, and like teaching students uh, in a very, let's say, um, vertical uh, learning process. Now, what we're trying to do is not only have a teacher or the the trainer stood up in front of you and like giving you this 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 menu of options and this menu of, of ideas so you can just um, uh, get it in your head. No, what we're trying to do now is give you the tools for you as a human being, as a, a analytic being, be able to question yourself. Is this, is this exactly the basis of everything? Is this correctly? Is this, um, everything that that we're supposed to be thinking is in anything outside the box so this is this is where um the academia uh, has the biggest opportunity to scale climate action and of course awareness 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 you can you see it everywhere you can see it even in a instagram post you can see it even in a single discussion through a whatsapp chat but um again one of the outcomes of um, the discussions that at the youth, um, let's say, uh, dialogues that we've been having in the PCCB, um, in the Asia Pacific region, there was a specific call for youth-led initiative within education systems. And this, again, connects back to how the academia is the perfect platform so you can create change but change into change based into a very specific science and foundation. It's not necessarily we're creating change, we are creating echo. No, we are creating, uh, we're trying to create a stronger education systems that focuses on climate action and sustainable development and not necessarily thinking about only natural resources and how is your relationship with the planet. It's thinking, it's, it's thinking that your relationship with the planet, it's impacting a little bit more than just my natural resources are, are like in a limited um, um, use. It's to engage uh, into a specific implementation of the NDC process, but also into a bigger connection of how do you, by connecting with that implementation of the NDC, you're also contributing with the sustainable development agenda of your country or your region, or specifically you as a human being, you have very specific ideas of how uh, sustainable development should be. So it's, 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 it's there. Education awareness is, is our the vehicle and will continue to be the vehicle. It's just our, our role to identify the best way to actually use that. Thank you. Thank you very much, Jennifer. Now I'd like to uh, give the floor to Dennis. Sorry. Yes, thank you very much. Uh, and uh, thank you uh, to Duncan and Jennifer for uh, their, uh, I think, already very comprehensive interventions. Um, I'm Dennis Mombo. I'm Director of Research and Knowledge Management at Slack and Trust. Um, so, I mean, I think we already covered uh, why uh, awareness creation and education are so essential. Um, so I, I just want to highlight a bit of the things that we are doing on this and that can be done as like good practices, uh, I hope at least. So uh, in all of our activities, um, we usually have awareness creation components uh, through our um, on different levels, like webinars on the international level and national level, uh, workshops and uh, like larger events on the national level, and then all the local group meetings, local workshops, uh, local level engagement. And in many of these, uh, we either target youth specifically, or we have youth components, uh, for example, separate breakout group for youth, uh, for example, um, separate uh, questions for youth or separate um, like thematic areas where we focus on youth components of uh, issues related to adaptation, to risk management, to um, uh, conservation of ecosystems, to the different topics we work on. So, um, and I think our goal of this is to um, not just like tell uh, to, to youth and young people, like uh, give them information and create awareness, but also to give them a space to uh, engage actively. I think Jennifer was it in the beginning who also said, uh, young people as capacity builders, not just as people, we build capacities of. And I think there's a very important point um, 
to give this space and this opportunity for young people to engage actively to ask questions and not just have uh, things told to them. That's why we have, uh, for example, today also these breakout groups where everyone will be able to uh, engage actively and tell their experiences and also um, learn from others and what they are doing. And I think these connections are a vital part of also awareness creation to um, to see what other youth are doing, what youth organizations are doing, how they're facing the same challenges uh, that you might be facing and uh, how they uh, have overcome them or um, what good practices they have used, what experience they had. Um, so yeah, I think this is an important component for awareness creation. Um, education, of course, is also very important and it goes in a similar direction. Uh, I think there should be spaces created, opportunities given for uh, youth within the education uh, curriculum to have these, uh, let's say, extracurricular activities to engage in uh, um, climate action, to engage in uh, like environmental conservation, uh, to learn about these things without having to compromise uh, like their um, educational success. So it should not be like things that are just happening on the side. Uh, it should be things that have uh, like uh, educational value attached to them and like also the form of credits. Uh, and one thing I would also like to highlight is the importance of when we talk about awareness and education to understand the baseline that is there and also the gaps there that are not covered by the existing education system, by existing awareness creation measures. So for example, in Sri Lanka, uh, we have um, conducted a, a survey, an island representative study, where we interviewed youth uh, between, um, I think, 15 and 25 years in all nine provinces of Sri Lanka and basically uh, assessed their awareness of climate change, their engagement in climate action, the barriers and obstacles that they saw in engaging and also the um, like willingness to engage. And uh, I cannot talk about the results yet, it's not published yet, it will be published uh, soon in the lead up to COP26. But um, I think there were very interesting findings and some aspects highlighted uh, where we have gaps in education and awareness creation that can be addressed uh, by uh, state actors, but also um, by organizations like Black and Trust, like uh, by think tanks, civil society organizations, community-based organizations, NGOs, uh, like all these actors working in this field. And um, we try to do this through our uh, projects. We always have a youth component in the projects. We have some specific things focused on youth, like the Global Youth Forum on Climate Change that Ashan has mentioned. And uh, for everything else, we have youth components. We try to actively engage youth and often we find that youth are already engaged in activities. They just don't know necessarily, for example, in the agricultural areas where we work with farming communities, they don't know how to link this to uh, like larger national processes and also international processes like those under the unit triple C. And um, so I think we can also play a part in linking these things that are already happening, like these entrepreneurships, these uh, like uh, community initiatives to link them to larger processes. Thank you. Thank you very much uh, for your input, Dennis. I would like to uh, hand it over to Sunny for his comments. Um, Sunny, can you hear us? I think you're muted uh, at the moment. Okay, so I, I think it's very important what I'll say about the education, because we know that education is the key. Is very much is uh, important uh, to engage young people and to let them know what we are in and to better educate them about the issue. So, for example, here in Niger, what we experiment is like you know, since 2012, uh, we created a green club club in school area. So, those club is open for all the students at the at the school area. So they have like uh, a possibility to. Uh, to experiment or to implement in, a, in climate actions, smaller climate action, and also to receive what we call uh, an education for climate change and sustainable development. It's a kind of a model, a program that we develop with some, uh, uh, or some teacher and the lecturer that we have here in Asia, and together we develop this plan, and that's helped all the students that are member for this club to learn more about climate change, about the challenges that our environment are facing. And also in terms of practice that allowed them to develop or to implement some small projects in their school and also at their community level. 
So that's allow them to better understand small, small topic about like uh, agroecologic tools, uh, tree planting, uh, wash and uh, hygiene and sanitation activities in their school. So all those things, uh, this kind of education allow them to better analyze and understand the challenge that we are facing. And in this uh, kind of activity that we are implement, we let them travel to, to uh, some area and also like to go and visit like some manufacturer or to go to the river or to go in some farm to better understand the challenges that we are telling and we are facing. Because as you know, here in the silent country, we don't have forest. We have like small area with trees. So we let them know to understand the importance of trees and the importance that planting trees. So this is the kind of activity that's here uh, our uh, organization try to implement for young people. And uh, due to the impact, the success of the kind of uh, program, today we have more than 10 green club, uh, green clubs in uh, 10 schools, not only in the main city like Niamey, but also in the interior of the country, like Agadez, uh, Difa, and now we're trying to implement it in some other region because uh, Niger, we have like six region, so we try to have the same club in all Asia. And also a part of this, we try to have like a, uh, a kind of uh, scientist for the University of Miami and other institute that we call uh, Institute for Research and Development is a French based organization that try to make in our uh, disposition like some scientists that come and try to let students know about their work as scientists to address some climate challenges. So for me, it's very important. And today it's very important to see how it's easy for us to mobilize more than 100 or 200 young people in those kind of issues. And a lot of them, when they go to the university, they try to orient themselves to some scientists or to some environmental issues uh, studies because they understand that's very important to learn more and to be involved and engage about the climate change and environmental issues. So for me, education is very important. When it's come to educate young people, that allow them to uh, tomorrow to take a better decision. And not only young people, it's today's very important to have the kids also involved in this kind, because today we are uh, now actually is like holiday. So in this part of holiday, it's very important for kids also to allow them to understand the importance for planting trees, the important for the or pollution or other issue regarding to climate change, because uh, that allow them when they grow to understand uh, how they can reduce their impact to the environment and how they can contribute to have a more sustainable environment throughout their community, throughout the country at, uh, and at the uh, international level. This is some uh, best practice and also our experiences about education. We still work on this to have in all the school that we have here in Niger, a specific program that allow people, young people to understand the challenges that we are facing in terms of climate change and how it's important to protect and preserve our environment by giving them small skills, uh, small tools that they can use uh, in their daily life. So this is our experience. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you very much, Sani, for your input. I think this discussion is uh, very interesting and very um, inspiration for, inspirational for all of us um, in the audience because you're bringing in experiences and challenges from all around the world. And that gives and that builds us a pathway to, uh, to make sure that the future is looking better, uh, especially with all the experiences that is currently being shared. So just to move on with our next question, uh, it is um, access to information is seen as a key challenge for youth to engage in policy and decision making processes. How can we address constraints and limitations through innovative solutions? I believe Duncan touched on this a little bit uh, at his uh, earlier discussion. So I'd like to open the floor again uh, to Duncan to get his input on this. Okay. Thank you very much. So <clears throat> access to information. <clears throat> yeah, I, I, what I, was, I think I was trying to say earlier was you, we actually have more 
we have access to more information now than we have ever had. Um, and there are challenges around that, but we no longer have to go to the library to get a book to find out things. Uh, we are fortunate that we have the internet. Um, we are fortunate you can make freedom of information requests in many countries to governments and to corporates. There, it, it is very possible if you look, you can find a lot of the information you need, whether it's for advocacy or whether it's for growing crops. I'm in the process of setting up a community farm at the moment, and I, I've literally gone on the internet and I've been using the informa information there to develop a lot of the tools. We've created a community interest company. I've got the local village involved. We've got hold of the land. So, and so all of that would have been a, taken a lot longer and been a lot harder many years ago. So I think we've got to accept that we could always have more information, but we've got a lot of information. And there's, and I think you look at some bodies like the UN, they are very good at sharing information and research. So, so sometimes I think it's people need to look for it because it's often there. And I've, I'm, I spent a lot of my career researching and I found you can find things. There is a big risk on information at the moment where you have information that fulfills your own bias. So if you, whether you're using Facebook, LinkedIn, you'll go wherever you go, you often end up having self-fulfilling information. So I think it, what's really important when you look at information is always question the conclusion and always look for an opposing view. Uh, I was taught by my grandfather at a very young age. Um, he basically never bought the same newspaper two days in a row. And he did this for the simple reason. He said that they will always give you the, the information or the, the, the story they want you to see. And if there's a story that interests you, the next day, buy the opposing political viewed newspaper and look for the same story, compare the two, and then you'll probably get the, the truth when you look at the two. And that's always stayed with me for my life. So when we're looking for information, always look for an opposing view because that can change what you're doing and that helps to avoid confirmation bias. Um, so that for me is my biggest lesson I've had, but I do think we need more information. There is more information out there. I think governments do hide it. I think corporates don't share what everything they don't want you to know. So I think it's really important to keep asking and keep asking and digging it. But also as you're learning, as we're learning new skills new about how to do stuff, you find out an amazing fact, tell people, make sure it's out there. If you do a project and it's successful, share the results. But if you do a project and it fails, share the results and share why. Because I've worked in international NGOs all my career and we are very, 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 very good at telling you when we've done things right but we are rubbish at telling you when we've done things wrong. And that can sometimes mean you end up going to somewhere to do a project and there's been five NGOs doing it before you. They have spent thousands and thousands of dollars on it, repeating the same mistakes. So I think that's the other thing. Share your mistakes and your failures. They are, if anything, more valuable than your successes. And then just talk to people about it. I don't care who you talk to, just talk to as many people as possible and share those facts. Thank you, Duncan. Thank you very much. That was very insightful and very, very useful. Um, so I'd just like to hand uh, the floor to Samuel to give his input on this as well. Yeah, thank you very much. Um, the issue of uh, information uh, as a major challenge in reaching uh, in reaching out to communities or to people or to uh, taking actions at the community level is uh, one of the fundamental things that we believe uh, can be can can be can be transformed and um, basically uh, for communities or areas actually that have limited access to internet for instance 
kids uh, that have uh, no 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 access to basic uh, technologies where they can actually adapt information from about climate change. I think one of the good approach is uh, transmically probably through print and through me can actually uh, get to uh read more and hear more about what uh that are, what are being planned or what actions are being taken on uh climate change because the local media uh the like the conventional media like the radio is a very good approach to reaching people at the community level more than even most uh technological uh innovations uh, or the, like the internet for instance so um I think it's one of the one of the ways is to create um, local programs where uh, information can be shared, where pro probably the local conversation on air trainings, where uh, such trainings can actually be conveyed to local people. Local people can actually hear. Uh, more of this information uh, on how to go about these practices and how to better improve on uh, their climate actions locally. So um, this is one of the ways where I think it's good. And of course, uh, where we have to adapt this to uh, probably the urban centers, of course, the internet has been of great use and available like through open learning systems, the Agoras and, and, and all of that. And of course, I just shared some information on the chat right now about a learning toolkit for young people that can be used. This was a very wonderful toolkit. Uh, I was part of the, the validation uh, of the toolkit. So I think um, I've been able to answer most of this question. Yes. Uh, yes, Tamla. thank you very much. Um, uh, yes, thank, thank you, you very much for your input and thank you for staying with us uh, to, to, throughout this event. Uh, I really value yeah. it. Very, very useful. Uh, just to move forward, I'd like to open the floor to Dennis uh, for his title. Yes, thank you very much. Thank you. Um, yeah, so access, for, access to information. Um, I just want to highlight, um, in addition to what was already said by uh, Duncan and Samuel, two, uh, two aspects. One is the policy aspect and one is uh, the creation of dissemination of knowledge products. So for policies, I think um, this access information is very important to uh, integrate. That's a big uh, policy challenge. And then, of course, the implementation of these policies. On the one hand, to integrate uh, access to information, um, transparency, uh, data sharing, these kinds of things into climate policies. But on the other hand, also, of course, to integrate climate change into existing uh, data sharing and uh, information and uh, transparency policies. So uh, in, in cli national climate policies, in national adaptation plans, in the NDCs, in uh, other climate related plans, processes, policies, we can push to integrate uh, this public access to information and also um, information sharing between different institutions, between different levels and between uh, government entities and uh, civil society and youth. And on the other hand, um, and that extends also, of course, not just to uh, policies by the government, but also institutional policies by, um, by the private sector and civil society organizations, NGOs. And I very much would like to underline what Duncan has said, also not to share only um, successes, but also to share um, by failures and to uh, share information, uh, even when things have been abandoned, like share information on why uh, these things haven't happened, why uh, they uh, had to be abandoned. And also, um, I think for NGOs, it's also important to share what they are doing, uh, even though they're not government entities. Um, I think there's still a, a public interest to know what they're doing and uh, to share information on their projects also. And then knowledge products, uh, that's a lot what we are doing also to um, enhance access to information. We try to create knowledge products uh, about issues uh, that affect youth and also for youth. So for example, last year um, during the TEPA uh, process, it's a technical examination process and adaptation. Um, we published uh, three um, knowledge products that highlighted the role of um, public participation in climate change adaptation 
on uh, integration of adaptation into education and on um, youth engagement for adaptation. Uh, so those can go to policymakers and organizations working on these topics uh, to better um, identify the key areas that should be integrated and also the gaps in integration. And on the other hand, we try to create knowledge products that are useful for youth specifically and uh, accessible for youth also. Um, and I think there's a lot that can be done to make them more accessible, to summarize information in like a, a visual way, to have them translated into local languages, I think is very important, and also to local contexts. Uh, there's a lot of knowledge products out there, um, very good knowledge products that highlight many issues. But then if you go like to a local level, there's very little available in, on specific knowledge products, uh, for example, it's, for youth in farming communities in Sri Lanka, uh, there's not a lot of information available how they could, uh, how climate change affects them and how they can engage in climate um, action. So there are these gaps that are there um, that organizations like Sky and Trust can work to fill. And um, I think it's a big challenge to make uh, knowledge products uh, both informative and accessible. Um, but I think it's certainly possible and uh, we are working on this to uh, really enhance the access to information on things we are working on on the topics that we are um, we have expertise in yeah thank you thank you very much dennis and uh, I, I believe we've got a lot of information a lot of input uh, and if anybody has any questions please do share with us um, on the chat box and there's a lot of information that has been shared on the chat box with regards to everything that we're speaking at the moment um just to move on to our final question uh what international and regional actions are taken to support the empower and support and empower you to engage in climate action at local national and international levels i'd like to start the discussion off uh by giving the floor, uh, floor to Camilo. Hello. Yes. Um, we can the hear. question is, uh, what are the international and regional actions uh, are taken to support and empower youth to engage in climate action at local, national, and international levels? Uh, when you see this, uh, the question, there are, you know, there are many processes that can be taken into consideration when it comes to international and regional process that are related to climate change that empowers youth as a key stakeholder. So starting from the UNFCCC's uh, New Delhi work program till uh, adopting uh, ACE as a term under the Article 6 of the Convention and Article 12 of the Paris Agreement. There have been support to empower youth to engage in climate action at local national and international levels. So localizing of the areas identified in these articles have always been an uphill task due to many reasons in most of the global South countries. Nevertheless, there are many successful attempts and work on empowering of youth to engage in protection through education, public participation, public access to information and international corporations have been carried out by using the concerns and limitations. While uh, identifying uh, conferences such as uh, UN Youth Climate, UN Youth Climate uh, Summit that was that happened in 2019 and conference of youth that is happening annually before every COP session and, uh, and three Three conferences such as Youth for Climate has, has progressive work for meaningful participation of youth in international process where they get an opportunity to share their knowledge and experiences. And it is also important to localize these processes in a way that matches the local context. Uh, one such example is, as Ashan mentioned in the in the first uh, uh, the question, uh, global. Youth Forum on Climate Change that has been uh, organized by the Flight and Trust that we have been organizing this for a 
would have a degree, empowering youth with the necessary knowledge, expertise, and training. So Ashan ex explain how it works uh, throughout these many years. Um, just a uh, quick thing. I think you're covering your mic. You're just becoming not clear sometimes. Hello. Yes. So, yeah. Uh, so we have been empowering youth with necessary knowledge, expertise, and training. So that's on the and the Global Youth Forum on Climate Change that was organized by Slack and Trust for Many Years. So this is uh, this is one such successful attempt in localizing and integrating ACE into climate process in a in a in a national scale. So when it comes to the local level, it is important to identify youth as a as a sort of a cross-cutting sector when developing and localizing of national processes such as NDCs and NAPs where youth in uh, each area will get an equal, meaningful and active participation at developing or as well as at the, at the implementation uh, stage. So, um, uh, and also, uh, uh, internationally, the collaboration between uh, multiple youth stakeholders who are engaged in such work is is very imperative so that there is a greater effectiveness in action. So the strength of a large collective of individuals and groups also ensure policymakers and global leaders sit up and take notice and act. So positive change is very possible and youth are one of the biggest drivers of this change. So, so I think it is very important to address these issues, taking youth as a as a sector, as a as a uh, as a sector, for when when you are in the decision making process and also the policy making process. That's it from my end. As we are running out of time, actually. Yes. Um, thank you, Kamidu. I'd like to get the get uh, the input from uh, Duncan on this question as well. Yes, sure. Um, thank you. So the international regional actions are taken to support and empower youth to engage on climate. I mean, one th what I I would say is actually. Uh, youth and young people have created the space to engage in the last three or four years because previously the options were not there and I think by things like the Greta, Greta Thunberg's work and others and raising your voices and really calling out and showing not only that you want change but you understand the issues and you have lost faith in the older generations. I think that has been an amazing catalyst for creating the space you needed because that space would not have been there previously. It's never been there before. And now, I mean, I'm working on COP26 on the Glasgow Dialogues, which are getting groups together to talk about the future of food and how that's related to climate change. And we, have, we are hosting dialogues based around youth for young people to get involved and we're taking them to COP26. And I think that we suddenly feel that we can do it because people are engaging on it. And I think that's one of the most important things to do is to keep pushing and keep engaging because this is an opportunity that I don't see change, is an opportunity that's rare. And so I, I think the fact that you've opened the door to this it's got to keep happening. We know at the um, pre-food system summit, there's a youth theme for it. We know the pre-COP um, in Milan at the end of September, there's a huge focus on young people and a youth summit in Milan as well. And I really think you have to engage on them. You have to, whether or not you support them 100%, you need to make sure you're there to have your voices heard. And I think it's really, important to make sure it's everyone not just the, a small group of people who've got better access to the resources to engage on it whether it's face-to-face -face in person or whether it's um 
via the remotely. So I think that for me is what's really important. I don't think enough actions are being taken to support and empower youth and you're having to create the space. I think there is a need for the UN, for international NGOs, for trusts, foundations and others to put money on the table to enable people to engage, to provide the training, to provide the digital infrastructure. But also in this day and age of COVID, I, I think we need to start providing the, providing the vaccines and the funds to get people to these events, because I, I think it's really important at these big events like the, the Biodiversity COP in Kunming in China is to have people seeing young people's faces there because i i've been to quite a few cops now and more and more young people have started to attend it and those are the people that are starting to change what's happening it's it's turning it's changing cops into a more engaging process so you need to be there and so we need to work together to work out how we can get some more people there so it's not just a group of the usual suspect talking about the usual things and i think that's really important but i do think basically on your question i don't think nearly enough is being done to support it and i my hats off to young people and to because they've made the space themselves and they've taken the initiative themselves and now it's time for the rest of us to go right we need how else can we help you but one key thing for you to do is tell us what you need because if you don't tell us what you need we we won't be able to provide it or help provide it if you need it Thank you. Thank you, Dan. And I completely agree with what you said as well. Um, just so that we uh, move on, I am going to open the floor to Dennis for to quickly answer this question. Quickly, yes. Okay. Um, right. So, uh, what international regional actions are taken to support and empower youth? So, um, one thing that was already mentioned uh, is what uh, Spike and Trust is doing, the Global Youth Forum on Climate Change, where we provide an opportunity and platform for people to, for young people to um, submit projects and then develop these projects with the guidance of experts and um, uh, of uh, our team, and then take these projects beyond the youth forum and uh, implement them on the ground, find funding for them, and then uh, like uh, build their own capacities and uh, create awareness among their own communities. Um, then one thing, of course, uh, that I feel should be mentioned is um, we do have uh, quite a few young people in our team, uh, it's like and trust itself. And uh, I think many of them, um, they, uh, they really use opportunities given to them. Uh, they uh, engage very actively in different fora and um, many uh, go on to um, like engage further into the processes, the junior triple process. Uh, uh, some go to COPS, uh, some uh, are selected in different uh, schemes. And I think that is also um, like just to have, uh, like to build these capacities. Uh, it's very, um, very satisfying to see that people um, like benefit from them and that we do have so much uh, young talent that is there. Um, one other thing that we're doing is we're developing a strategy for youth um, uh, engagement in climate action and in climate policy processes. Uh, we are looking at a global strategy, but we are also looking at country strategies based on this uh, one in Sri Lanka, and then there are several African countries we are working with, uh, for example, Niger and uh, Ghana, where we also try to um, support the development of uh, a youth engagement strategy, of a strategy that can help uh, climate action um, be more open and uh, for youth and better integrated into uh, policies. And Sunny, I think you. Are, yeah, okay. Sorry. Uh, yeah, and actually, this um, event today is also going to be part of this process. Uh, we had previous events, and uh, we are collecting input from youth and from people working with youth and from youth organizations for these uh, strategy development processes. And we are going to have a few more sessions um, where we uh, collect input. Through the breakout groups and also through um, like uh, the question and answer sessions that will go directly into the development of this uh, strategy and uh, some are based on different sectors like we had one that focuses on ocean action and like coastal and marine uh, climate action 
um, others are more general focused on the role of youth in international processes, in national processes and on the local level. And then we're going to take this to uh, some um, country partners and organizational partners and refine it and have then a validation by experts and then these strategies will be published, they will be accessible and they will hopefully be um, taken up into these policy making decision making processes. And yeah, that's, I, I, I keep it short. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Dennis. I am just going to get, uh, just going to give it to Jennifer as well. Uh, wish we more. Rani, Jennifer has yes. said on the chat that she has, uh, that she's leaving. I'm, I'm so sorry, I just saw that. Uh, so, um, Sani, I would like to check with you if you would be able to uh, give your input to all these questions as well. Yes, uh, thank you. Uh, uh, I think that uh, I, I can add uh, the, the need of uh, the space. It's very important to have the kind of space, but at the national level, there's a few space, like here in Niger, we have an annual uh, youth forum. So this is a kind of event that allow young people to discuss uh, about climate change and to empower them also to take action. Uh, but this is the only one that we have. But we have like at the university, we have a kind of master program. It's a kind of new dedicated program called uh, climate uh, master on climate change with uh, the WASCAL. WASCAL is a West, uh, West African uh, university because it's got a student from uh, several countries. We have also some other regional institutions that have their own uh, program uh, that try to empower young people uh, in terms of climate change challenges. At the regional level, what we have is like, I think for me is like uh, two space. The first one that we have, uh, the African Ministry Conference, uh, the African uh, Ministry, Environmental Ministry, they have like an annual conference to prepare their participation to the COP for the UNFCC. So this is a kind of space that sometimes young people have the opportunity to be part, to take part, and also to address some issues or, and to receive a kind of training or knowledge about what's going on, about the challenges. So, and we have in some countries, like in West Africa, we have the COI, the, the claim, uh, Conference of, of Youth on Climate Change. This is like a kind of, sometimes you have some countries that have their own national one, and we have in uh, regionally also like uh, for West Africa, we have one that gather people in Benin or Togo. So that gather like two, three four, or five, more than 10 countries, young people coming from this country to discuss about this issue. We have like uh, the African Climate Week. So it's also a kind of opportunity that young people are allowed to be there and to engage with the, the people. So part of this, we have like now uh, some training and seminar with the African negotiator group is a kind of uh, think tank group that try uh, to help uh, the African government and also the young people to receive or to gain more knowledge about the new UNFCC negotiation and others process. So I can call also some specific program or project that are leading with some partner like CARE. Like with CARE, we develop uh, the project called ALAP Adaptation Learning and Advocacy Program. And this part also, we have a component, youth component that give them more knowledge about uh, the ABC, adapt the community-based adaptation program and some knowledge about climate change and how young people can must engage at locally and also internationally. So this is the kind of, uh, for me, the kind of space uh, and opportunity that young people have to, to receive more training, to be more empowered or to engage. But for me, I think the space is very weak. It's not enough regarding to the number of young people and also to the challenge that we are facing. Today, we have in the majority countries that we have in Africa, the most people are young. So youth people need knowledge. They need to be involved. They need space. So for me, it's, it's very important to have a kind of recommendation that can allow young people to be part 
uh, to stay uh, near the table, not <laughs> to the table, but near the table uh, tomorrow in the same. Because tomorrow they have the one that must take the decision or to contribute to take the decision. So it's very important to have this young component and spaces at every country that uh, young people must know that if they need more information or more knowledge about climate change, this is their space or this is the kind of institution that help them to more understand or uh, to make some awareness campaign and uh, other activities. This is uh, the kind of experience. Thank you. Thank you very much, Sani, for your input. Uh, before we, we move on, I'd like to open the floor uh, to any questions. Uh, we've had a very, very interesting discussion in the chat uh, box. Just to start off with, um, I'd like to bring, uh, I'd like to ask uh, one question that was raised uh, at the earlier bit of the discussion. It was how can we have enabling environment for youth participation, most specifically the, the ones that um, lack social enmities like internet and electricity? How do we incorporate them and leave no one behind? I believe most of our panelists touched on this uh, briefly, but um, this question is open to uh, anybody who'd like to take it. you uh, Duncan or Dennis who anybody who would like to just uh, give their opinion on this question I mean I can I can try I, I don't want to like a hawk all the talking space um, so I mean obviously one way to reach um, those uh, communities and groups that don't have uh, like the access like that is to go to them, of course. That's what we are doing like when we work with the farming communities, when we work with uh, like uh, coastal communities, we go to the ground, we organize workshops and group meetings there, and then we follow up with them. Um, for some things, of course, it's not possible, especially now in these COVID times, uh, it's uh, often difficult to engage um, without virtual access. So. Um, one thing we should push for all this, of course, to enhance infrastructure and uh, give better access to uh, people who don't have it. So they can engage in virtual processes that might involve capacity building, but it might just also be the uh, communications and technological infrastructure. Um, but in the absence of that, uh, I think going to communities and working with them directly is one way. Um, and then uh, maybe finding other ways to, uh, to have events. For example, we had some hybrid events where groups in one location joined a virtual event. So there could be like a representative from an organization going there, setting up the opportunity for virtual participation and have people join as a group um, through this without each of them having um, virtual access. And um, I'm sure there are many other uh, ways to do this. Maybe someone else wants to expand on this a bit. The uh, floor is open if uh, any of the other panelists would like to. Uh, yes, Duncan? Yeah, I, I'll just say from what we're doing at the moment, there's two things, because as so Dennis has answered it very well, and there's very little to add. But the two, so two things that we're doing, one with our work around um, COP26 and the dialogues, is we are we are actively trying to find community champions or people who can engage on this subject so we're doing a thing called the glasgow uh, dialogues where we're having dialogues all around the world to get community leaders or farming champions to talk around food system and to bring and then they are entrusted to bring together of 20 30 people to have a discussion around how climate change um is impacting on food what they need from what farmers need what local governments can do and they're feeding the information to us so it's very much a case of we are trusting that the right people are coming and we're providing these people with training of like facilitation skills and we are guaranteeing and some say recording skills and we are guaranteeing that we will then amplify the outcomes of their dialogues at a global event during the cop 26 so that's one way and that's empowering 
a champion to work with the local community and and we've had some brilliant brilliant sort of results in like nigeria where they've gone out to group to areas where they have we don't have any internet so and they've got them talking and they're bringing it to us and we and we are being trusted to represent it on the national the global stage because we're, we're assuming cop won't be in person this year the other thing we're doing is one our advocacy stage and i'm doing this with a few organizations we are as actively pushing governments at the moment to invest in digital infrastructure instead of just investing in subsidizing oil and gas or the usual things they're putting money in we're talking about the whole leveling up agenda and we're in we are pushing governments to say if you're going to work with other countries particularly those of less infrastructure than than yourself so northern countries working with southern countries digital infrastructure is absolutely key to make sure it reaches everyone and to make sure it's fair you can't have one country having 5g and one country having 3g you've got to make it so everyone has access to the digital infrastructure because then everyone can have access to the information they need to adapt to climate change to have access to markets to you know have access to education so there's a big role to really push governments to support that and we're also talking to the UN about it we're talking to the World Bank about it because we think this is probably one of the key ways to creating a more level playing field in the future thank you very much uh, Duncan for your input uh, before we move on to just to maybe roughly go through what is discussed on the chat I'd like to invite everybody uh, if we could switch on our cameras to take a picture uh, of this session for our our records. If all of us could switch on our cameras, I think it would. So wait another minute. A few seconds, Rafa. Um, okay, everyone, please give us your biggest smiles while we take a few screenshots. Just keep smiling because we're going to take as many as we can. Thank you. I think we have enough. Thank you very much. Thank you, everybody. Uh, just before we move on, um, I'd like to uh, invite anyone who has any questions to unmute themselves and ask if you do so. Yes. Um, anybody who'd like to? Uh, add anything or ask any questions that they may have. Um, just to run to some of the things that were discussed in the chat, uh, there was limitation to access in terms of information um, because of the language barrier. And there was a discussion on how uh, transmit and reach of information in rural, rural areas uh, with local languages uh, is something that needs to be looked at. So there were very, uh, very important and very informative discussions in the chat. And there are quite a few links for very uh, interesting tools that was shared by our panelists on, on the chat as well. So if you could refer to the chat, you'll be able to uh, access these tools as well. Just before we move on, I'd like to thank everyone, uh, thank our panelists uh, for their very knowledgeable session. Um, and I believe we all gathered a lot of information uh, and points of action. Now, we are now going to move on to our breakout sessions where we all will be discussing um, a few questions and our ideas on certain challenges um, yes, I believe we have uh, Maurice, who has raised your hand. Yes. Hello, everyone. Uh, good evening from Philippines. I am Maurice Janoxilias. By the way, I would like to thank uh, the organizers for having this kind of webinar. But, um, you know, I would, I would like also to give my inputs regarding climate change here in Philippines. So for me, I think we need to increase awareness. Uh, of young people because I'm also I am also a DRRM advocate and a the disaster officer here in Philippines. So we we move um, we are going to uh, we we're, we are conducting 
uh, different kinds of um, information dissemination in community. So we are going to coastal areas uh, and the remote areas and uh, to distribute or disseminate a guidebook regarding uh, climate change. So if you have any um, a guidebook that uh, we are going to publish and uh, we are going to disseminate it to remote areas, just I would like to request if I am going to have a copy on that. Uh, in, in the near future or or if, if if you will send me a copy of that we will we are going to disseminate it in uh, remote areas and the coastal areas in order for them to increase the awareness of uh, young people in our community so that's all and thank you so much for having this kind of webinar Thank you very much for your input, Maurice. That was very, uh, very insightful. So now uh, we would like to move into our breakout sessions. And uh, yes, so before we do that, I would like to again thank all our, our panelists for their valuable input and everything that you have said. I believe personally we've learned a lot from different processes to challenges and very innovative solutions from all parts of the world, which is very inspirational and encouraging. So let's take this enthusiasm and go into our breakout rooms to provide all our inputs there as well. And you will place, you will uh, get a box, uh, a drop, uh, um, a dialog box on your screen to join these breakout groups. Now, give us a minute or so. Yes. Thanks, Rani. And uh, just also want to thank everyone who joined us on Facebook. We will be ending the stream now, so thank you very much. And uh, in case you want to join, just drop us a message on Facebook, and we'll send you a link. But thank you to those who joined us on Facebook, and the room should open in about thirty seconds. 